Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the podcast and today I'm going to do my review of AEW's Dynamite. Starting off the evening we have a JAS mandatory meeting. JAS called out Jericho, Jericho comes down to the ring. Jericho talks about the issues that he has with the JAS or the issues that are going on in the JAS. Garcia then talks about what he's done with Jericho and the JAS and then he also leaves, gets out of the ring and goes to the back. Hager then talks about the hat, he also leaves the ring. Jericho then says he's helped elevate their careers. Ty Mello then disses Jericho. Mello then walks away from the JAS. Anna Jay then hypes up her match later on that night with Sheeta, but she also walks away from Jericho in the JAS. Angelo Parker then talks about Jericho not helping him when he needed his help, and then Angelo Parker also walks away from the group. And then Matt Menard says Jericho has helped him out in his personal life. He's also his idol, but he also had to walk away from the JAS. Guevara is the last one in the ring. Guevara talks about what he's done for Jericho and what Jericho's done for him in his career. Guevara doesn't completely walk away from Jericho, but he still wants to see what happens with Chris Jericho. It was also noted that Guevara was also wearing an inner circle vest uh, from Jericho's first group in AEW. So it looks like uh, the Jericho Appreciation Society man has imploded on itself pretty much, and it looks like it is no longer a faction as of right now. Um... The whole Guevara thing is very interesting, man, because to me, there has been a little bit of speculation that Ortiz and Santana might return to AEW, which would be fantastic if Ortiz and Santana are back, especially in the tag team, uh, you know, swing of things as far as AEW, because I think they're desperately needed in that tag team division. Not only that, this could be something, too, where, you know, Guevara does stick it out with Jericho. And, you know, Garcia, Anna J, they all do their own thing. And Guevara still, you know, teams up with Jericho. And this also gives the opportunity to bring in Santana Ortiz into a storyline and bring them back into AEW to once again reform the inner circle, which was Jericho's first group in AEW. Now, that could be a possibility. There's also a possibility, too, that Jericho can join Don Callis. We're supposed to get the decision on whether or not Jericho is going to join Don Callis and his family next week on Dynamite. So... Next week, Dynamite's going to be absolutely awesome. But, again, man, it's really up in the air on what Jericho's going to do. I, Me, personally, would I be surprised if Jericho joins Don Callis? Not entirely. But it would also be pretty cool if, you know, Jericho does kind of reform, if you will, the inner circle. And we get Jericho, you know, realigning himself once again with Guevara, Santana, and Ortiz. Because it has been kind of rumored that Santana is on his way back, as well as Ortiz back to AEW, so I'm all for that if that were to be the case and what Jericho is going to be doing next, but again, we'll find out next week whether Jericho is going to join Don Callis and his family or not. Moving on from that, we go into our first official match of the night. It is Matt, well, Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy, the Hardy Boys versus the Young Bucks. I thought it was a good match, man. Back and forth match between both teams with the Young Bucks keeping the pace of the match. Matt Hardy and Matt Jackson both exchanged in the middle of the ring with Jeff hitting a whisper in the wind on the Young Bucks. The Hardys then hit a twist of fate on both the Young Bucks, with Jeff then hitting a swanton off the top rope on Nick Jackson for a near fall. The Young Bucks then hit a BTE trigger on Matt Hardy, pins for the three, and your winners of the match are the Young Bucks. After the match, Matt Jackson grabs a microphone, then hands the microphone to Nick Jackson. Nick Jackson calls out FTR. FTR end up showing up. They, they walk down to the ring, get face-to-face with the Young Bucks, and it looks like it's official. We are going to get FTR defending the AEW Tag Team Championships against the Young Bucks at All In, which is absolutely awesome. Again, just adds more, you know, fire to what All In is all about coming up in, I believe it's August 27th. It should make for a fantastic match and hopefully fantastic card for the fans. But uh, this is definitely one of those matches at All In. I definitely want to see the rubber match between FTR and the Young Bucks. After that, it was announced that there will be a tournament for the AEW Women's Championship, which will take place throughout you know the next few weeks leading up to All In. The winners of these tournament matches will actually compete in a fatal four-way at All In for the AEW Women's Championship. Now, Tony Storm is also a part of this tournament. She gets a first round by something with her contract or whatever gets her a rematch with Sheeta. Um, to be honest with you, am I all for this tournament format for All In? Not entirely. I mean. For what it's worth, man, I don't understand why Tony Storm ended up dropping the belt to Sheeta anyway, not taking anything away from Sheeta, but again, there's a lot of, you know, crazy things right now going on in that women's locker room, which I will touch base on towards the end of this podcast, man, but uh, there's definitely something going on in that women's locker room, and it's been, you know, heavily shown in the past few weeks 
uh, with Dynamite, even, you know, tonight's, you know, Dynamite's main event that happened last night, too, which, again, I will, you know, try to give more detail on what I think's going on in the AEW Women's Locker Room towards the end of this podcast, but, again, there's a tournament going on, and the winners of those tournaments will create a fatal four-way for the AEW Women's Championship at all in. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It's for the FTW Championship and a no disqualification FTW rules match, if you will. It is Jack Perry versus RVD. This is actually RVD's debut match for AEW. The match itself was a good match. Back and forth matchup between Perry and RVD with RVD hitting a spin kick off the apron on Jack Perry. That looked absolutely brutal. RVD then hits a rolling thunder in the middle of the ring on Jack Perry. RVD then throws Jack off the top rope through a table to the outside. RVD then hits his signature five-star frog splash on Jack Perry for a near fall. Referee was also taken out in this match. Aubrey Edwards get in, gets involved in this match is now the new referee. Perry then throws RVD through a chair, which allows Jack Perry to hit a roll-up on RVD. Pins for the three. And your winner of the match and still FTW champion is Jack Perry. Hats off to Jack Perry for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we have an MJF and Adam Cole segment. MJF hypes up the crowd. Cole then hypes up their match at All In. Cole then wants to go after the Ring of Honor Tag Team titles. And it looks like Adam Cole wants to go against Aussie Open for the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships at All In at the Zero Hour, the kickoff show before the actual All In event. MJF agrees. Roderick Strong is here. Strong looks like he's upset. MJF then mocks Strong, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. And then Roderick Strong is then joined by Kingdom, which I thought was kind of odd to see, you know, Roderick Strong teaming up with the Kingdom, you know, Matt Taven and all and that team and stuff like that. Um, again, man, I was kind of shocked to see Roderick Strong kind of teaming up with the Kingdom. I don't know if the Kingdom's kind of, you know, trying to recruit Roderick Strong. That's still yet to be seen, but obviously there's a little hostility there between MJF and Roderick Strong. Um, after that, though, Cole ends up pushing MJF. So I don't know if Cole's kind of taking Roderick Strong's side on this. This could be also something, too, where I want people to realize that this could be something where MJF does stay a babyface and Cole turns heel, you know, and maybe joins the kingdom. You know, obviously, Matt Taven and, you know, Adam Cole are good friends. Um, obviously, there's a lot of history there between, you know, you know, Matt Taven and Adam Cole and the kingdom and stuff like that, especially their time in Ring of Honor. Um and Cole has a lot of allegiance to Ring of Honor, too, man. Cole, you know, has hyped up Ring of Honor. And a lot of really, really good talent has come to the doors of Ring of Honor as well, including Adam Cole and guys like Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins. A lot of very good talent has come through Ring of Honor. Um, am I surprised that, you know, Cole and MJF wanted to challenge for the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships? A little bit. And the aspect that the fact that I feel like Ring of Honor is not doing that well, if I'm being honest. I, I truly feel like Ring of Honor is... An adaptation, if you will, of what AW Dark and AW Elevation was. It's, it's literally those two shows combined to make Ring of Honor. And, and I'm not, again, I'm not taking anything away from Ring of Honor. I think Ring of Honor is one of those companies that get very much overshadowed and are severely underrated with what they, you know, what they, the body of work they put in over the years and the stars that have walked through those doors and became literally, like literally legends. I mean, Brian Danielson, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, and I mean Adam Cole. This is just name a couple guys that have walked through the doors for Ring of Honor that made a name for themselves from Ring of Honor going into other companies like WWE or New Japan, so on and so forth, AEW. But as of late, Ring of Honor is not what Ring of Honor used to be. And that's a, that's a proven fact. Now, could Ring of Honor get to that? Yeah, possibly. But as of right now, I feel like it's kind of AEW's developmental. You know, kind of AEW's NXT, if you will, with, you know... Not the same, you know, not the same hype around it, and not the same match qualities that you were getting from the Black and Gold brand from NXT. But I, I do feel like Ring of Honor right now is AEW's developmental, and it just kind of goes to show you that I feel like Tony Khan has too much stuff on his plate right now to put a lot of focus into Ring of Honor and AEW, pretty much simultaneously. Because it, you know, this goes to show you that, you know, one of those shows are going to be lacking with, you know, the product and what they're trying to do. And I feel like Ring of Honor is kind of taking a back seat right now to Dynamite and Rampage, and Collision, you know, and rightfully so. I mean, Dynamite is their primary show. That's what got them, you know, through the doors with TNT and TBS and stuff like that. But, you know, I was kind of surprised that, you know, Adam Cole and MJF decided to go after Aussie Open for the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships. Maybe it brings a little bit more spotlight to Ring of Honor. 
if Adam Cole and MJF happen to win those championships, I can almost guarantee you if Adam Cole and MJF happen to beat Aussie Open for those Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions, it's going to get a lot more eyeballs on what Ring of Honor is doing and the fact that people are going to be more inclined to watch Ring of Honor to see you know Adam Cole and MJF possibly defend those Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships on Ring of Honor television. So that's still yet to be seen. But again, exciting, st- exciting stuff, and I, th- I think it should make for a great match at All In's Zero Hour. Now, moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is the Lucha Bros versus John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli. I thought it was a good match. Back and forth matchup between both teams with the Blackpool Combat Club, keeping the pace of the match. Phoenix and Claudio then both exchange in the middle of the ring with Moxley and Penta also exchanging in the middle of the ring. Moxley ultimately hits a roll-up, pins for the three, and your winners of the match are the Blackpool Combat Club. After the match, Moxley and Claudio end up attacking the Lucha Bros to pretty much send a message most likely to Pac or to any other tag team in the division in AEW that the Blackpool Combat Club are, if not the best stable in AEW, and they're not going anywhere anytime fast, and they were forced to be reckoned with. So hats off to John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli for getting the win in that matchup. Moving on from that, we have a Swerve segment. Swerve Mox, Nick Wayne. AR Fox then calls out Darby Allen. Darby is here. Darby then hypes up AR Fox. He also said he respects AR Fox. He also says some of the things that Fox has been saying has been absolutely wrong and false. And then Swerve said that he has friends. He has backup. Darby Allen says he also has friends as well. The lights go out. Sting ends up showing up, taking out the Mogul Embassy, um, or taking out members of the Embassy. And he's left in the ring with Swerve. He ends up attacking Swerve. He then takes the bat and then points to the sign it all in. And it looks like it's official. It is going to be Darby Allen and Sting teaming up against AR Fox and Swerve at all in in a coffin match. Which I think, again, it's going to be one of those matches that is severely underrated on that card, man. The stuff that Darby Allen and Sting have done. Especially Sting, man. I mean, it's been absolutely incredible. So that match, it being a coffin match, is going to be absolutely insane at All In. I'm definitely looking forward to that as well. Uh, moving on from that, we go into our main event of the evening. It is Anna J versus Hikaru Shida for the AEW Women's Championship. I thought it was a good match. Back and forth matchup between Anna J and Shida, with Shida keeping the pace of the match. With Shida ultimately hitting the finish on Anna J, pins for the three. And your winner of the match and still AEW Women's Champion is Hikaru Shida. Hats off to Shida for getting the win in this matchup. A couple of things I want to say about Dynamite Man before I get out of here. Um, and again, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, is the women's division. Now, a lot of people had touched based on this. And, you know, I really did look into a lot of the stuff that was being said, you know, about the AEW Women's Locker Room and stuff like that. And kind of, you know, took a hard look into what was really... what. What the hell really was going on? Um, To be honest with you, man, (sighs) honestly, this stems back, I would honestly say, from the time, and I'm not trying to point fingers here, but I'm just trying to piece this all together. Um, This stems back to me, honestly, from the whole issue from Baker to Thunder Rosa. I I think Baker, you know, has this, you know, the way that I was being told is that there's obviously different cliques backstage, you know, there's friends back there. You know, obviously, Britt Baker's good friends with Jamie Hayter and stuff like that and so on and so forth. But there was a independent wrestler that came into AEW to do a couple, you know, dark matches like AEW Dark or Elevation. She came into the fold, wanted to know what was going on, stuff about her match, if she was going to get an entrance, stuff like that. And a lot of people were downplaying her, you know, were making, you know, poking fun at her and stuff like this. And it's kind of crazy because Baker has been in the news as of late. I mean, there was also ties to her making comments possibly um, in the Ty of Valkyrie match when Ty of Valkyrie was getting all this different, you know, disrespectful stuff and all this flack from fans, you know, about her match with Baker and how she looks and all this stuff and, and kind of body shaming her, man, which I, I think that's complete BS, to be honest with you, man. I mean, look, at the end of the day, these people are laying their lives on the line to wrestle. You know, do I think Ty Valkyrie can wrestle? Absolutely. She wouldn't be there if the girl couldn't wrestle. She can wrestle. You know, it's you don't have to look you don't have to look maybe like the way she looks or something like that. It, it's people will go out of your way, man, no matter how good you're doing just to bash you for no apparent reason. And there was no reason nor was it acceptable for anybody to bash Ty Valkyrie at, at all. I mean, it's unacceptable, man. Completely unacceptable. Was there a match that good between Baker and Ty Valkyrie? Absolutely not. The, the match, it, it just wasn't there between Baker and Valkyrie. But there was no reason for people to go out of their way to completely bash Ty Valkyrie for no apparent reason. I mean, it's completely disrespectful, man. It's uncalled for. It's just unjust. It, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. 
Um, but with that being said, I mean, there's also, you know, inner turmoil within the AEW women's locker room. And I think it's it's being shown predominantly as the past two weeks for AEW. You know, it's kind of funny because the fa- past two weeks for Dynamite, there's been, the main event has been women's matches. So clearly Tony Khan is getting word of this and fans are upset because fans know that, you know, the AEW women's locker room is not getting booked properly. And honestly... And I hate saying this, but this this kind of feels like it's absolutely true. A lot of the the way the women were being booked, a lot of it has changed since Jade had dropped the TBS championship. And I think people need to pay attention to that. You know, I don't know if Jay Cargill is coming back or not, but I feel like Tony Khan put a lot of investment in the undefeated streak and what Jay Cargill was doing with the TBS championship. There was some storylines with Jade. And as far as women matches are concerned, a lot of it was actually wrapped around Jay Cargill. It wasn't like, you know, the TBS championship was actually getting showcased a hell of a lot more than the AW Women's Championship. And Jade was the the front runner of that. She was the one pushing that TBS championship and making it more predominantly known than the AW Women's Championship. This was kind of the same thing with, if you're looking at it from the men's side, with the TNT championship in the beginning. The TNT Championship was the best thing since sliced bread over the AEW World Championship, and now that's completely, completely different. Honestly, I mean, I think the International Championship is getting more lineage than any other title from the men's side in AEW. And what Orange Cassidy is doing by defending that belt, I think he's doing a fantastic job. But yeah, I think the women's division is hurting severely. I, I think the direction of what they're trying to do here is lacking. You know, it's just there's no storylines leading up to what the hell is going on here. I mean, it goes hand in hand with what I was just saying earlier about Sheeta. I'm not disrespecting Sheeta by any stretch of the means. I'm not. She's a great wrestler and a great competitor. But on paper, what has Sheeta done to earn or deserve a title shot against, at the time, Tony Storm, who was a champion, and then dethrone Tony Storm to become the new AEW Women's Championship? I think the reason why that came into effect is because. There were some issues with the locker room and the women's locker room side of AEW, and there needed to be a change-up, if you will. And unfortunately, Tony Storm had to drop the belt to Sheeta. Tony Storm's not hurt at all. She's going to compete at All In. She has a bye leading up into this tournament, and she's in the Fatal 4-Way at All In. She's not injured. So I don't understand why she dropped the belt to Sheeta when Sheeta hasn't really done anything for a while. So again, you have to ask yourself the question, Why did that happen? What the hell was really going on with the women's locker room? And clearly something is going on. You know, the past two weeks, ever ever since all this stuff came out with Taya Valkyrie and Britt Baker and this whole interview with, I I believe her name is Lou Fista or Lou Fusto or I think it's Lou Fista. Uh, Don't quote me on that. But ever since that interview came out, you know, and what she said about the AEW women's locker room and how how toxic toxic it was, and how just volatile it was. It just, it kind of, I feel like it kind of got to Tony Khan. And Tony Khan was like, oh, we can't have this. No, now we're going to put the women in the main event, which I'm all for that. But don't do it because you guys got called out on your BS. You know, this issue needs to be fixed. And I mean, again, this is, not, I'm not just blaming the women on this. It's also the same thing with the men. I mean, there's been issues with Guevara and Kingston and Guevara and somebody else and yada, yada, yada. It needs to be fixed. And again, I'm not trying to poke the bear here. I'm not. But at the same time, too, it's been prevalent on what the hell is going on with this AEW Women's Locker Room, and it needs to be fixed. You know, from the bashing of Taya Valkyrie, which is absolutely just, I, I can't even express how much insane that really is, that people went out of their way to demoralize this woman based upon a match or how she looks. Look, man, at the end of the day, Taya Valkyrie can wrestle. She's there for a reason. And she's a competitor, man. You, you know, you're sitting there and, and everybody, I mean, I just, I don't understand that. I don't get that. You know, as a just a person, as a fan, you know, everybody was like, oh, everybody was excited when Ty Valkyrie came into AEW and then was challenging, you know, Jay Cargill because, at least from my perspective, everybody was kind of assuming, oh man, they brought in Ty Valkyrie, this might be the person to actually dethrone Jay Cargill because, not taking anything away from Jay Cargill, but everybody because of her undefeated streak, everybody was wondering who was going to be the person to end the streak. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't Ty Valkyrie, and it was a returning Chris Statlander that ended up, you know taking the streak away from uh, Jay Cargill and the rest is history. Statlander became the new TBS champion and, you know, Jay Cargill took some time off. We don't even know if Jay's going to come back or not. That's still yet to be seen. But, again, the women's division needs to be booked a a hell of a lot better than what it has been. There needs to be predominant storylines for the women's division. 
to get people invested in these matches, man. You can't just throw these matches together and nobody's really interested in what the hell's going on. And there's all this toxicity backstage with the women's locker room. They need to figure that out first. And everybody needs to be on the same team. You know, I mean, it's kind of funny because you hear like, you know, MJF and Cole had that match with FTR. And after that match, you know, MJF even said they're team AEW. This needs to be the same thing for the women's locker room. This should be a well-oiled machine. I'm not saying everybody's going to get along every single day and there's not going to be some issues here and there with different people. I'm not saying that. But the common goal should be Team AEW. And if you don't want to be there, there's the door. Get the hell out. Go somewhere else. You know, everybody keeps hyping up WWE, but I can tell you this right now from what I read the other day with, you know, obviously Endeavor purchasing, you you know, Endeavor, the company for UFC, the parent company of UFC, if you will, bought WWE, there, there's going to be possible roster cuts coming down the line here for WWE probably sometime next month when Endeavor fully takes on WWE. You know, they might push Vince McMahon out, there might be roster cuts and, and budget cuts and stuff like that, and the roster might seriously be infected or affected by that um, due to the budget cuts. So, again, you know, maybe going to WWE is not the best option, too, if you're not happy with AEW or something like that. So, Again, I mean, it just goes for all the people that's on the roster for AEW. You know, it, it it should be running like a well oiled machine. All, but besides that, I mean, AEW last night was absolutely great. I thought it was a really good show. You know, some people were kind of downplaying the Hardys match versus the Young Bucks. Look, man, for what it's worth, that was probably the best I've seen from Jeff Hardy in quite a while. It was a great match. Jeff Hardy was, you know, keeping the pace. He wasn't sloppy or anything else like that. I mean, he was keeping toe to toe with the Young Bucks and what they were doing, and it made for a decent match. With them and the Young Bucks. It was a solid matchup. There was more matches announced for All In. Which a lot of people including myself. Were kind of wondering when these matches were going to be announced. Because All In's not that far away from now. You know we got a tournament lineup. For the AEW Women's Championship. We have Sting and Darby Allen Versus AR Fox and Swerve in a coffin match. Fantastic. We got the Bucks versus FTR as well. As All In. We even have a hint of what Kenny Omega might be doing for All In. Uh, he's supposed to have an interview. A sit down interview with Jim Ross next week. To discuss his future and possible future opponent for AEW's All In, which I'm definitely excited for that. And again, man, it was a solid show. I'm not sitting here saying that Dynamite last night was a bad show. It's just I haven't really touched base on you know everything that was going on in the women's locker room. I know a lot of news and rumors have come out about the AEW's women locker women's locker room. And yeah, it's hostility, man. I mean, it's definitely not a good thing. And obviously, it's been heavily shown in the past two weeks. With Tony Khan putting the main event as, you know, a women's matchup. But don't, I mean, my thing is, you had to know something. Why why are you trying to do something about it now? You know, and I'm sorry, man. And I'm not trying to shoot anybody in the foot here or anything else like that. but Or point the finger. But, uh, you know, a spade's a spade, man. I think Britt Baker also has a big, serious issue and an ego backstage in that AEW women's locker room. There's been multiple times where her name has come up with issues now. With the women backstage in the AEW locker room, stemming from Thunder Rosa, from Taya Valkyrie, and then this issue that, you know, you had this independent wrestler come in, and then, you know, you had Baker making comments and stuff like that. So, again, you know, and Baker being a part of her own little clique backstage with Jamie Hayter and stuff like that, I'm not trying to bash Baker. I think Baker's a really good wrestler. I just think her ego is a little much. <laughs> I think that she tries to be, you know, the queen of the locker room. And I'm not, again, she's a very good wrestler. But, you know, you're bringing these people in. And I feel like Tony Khan has his favorites. Don't get me wrong. I do believe Tony Khan does have his select few favorites in AEW that he does give them a kind of a a hard pass and, you know, kind of a slap on the wrist and, you know, lets things be. I do think that does happen. And I'm not just saying that's Baker. I also believe that's the Young Bucks. I believe that's CM Punk. I believe that's Baker. I believe that's Sammy Guevara. I do think that there's certain wrestlers on that roster that, go, you know, Tony Khan does kind of turn a blind eye to and kind of, you know, just a slap on the wrist and, you know, let's kind of, you know, dial this down and let's move on rather than other people he might reprimand a little bit more than his select favorites. And I, I do think that's 100% true, man. I think Tony Khan does have a few people on that roster that he kind of turns a blind eye to. And I think big uh, Britt Baker is... One of them, I do. I, her name has come up in a lot of serious issues in the AEW women's locker room. I mean, especially with Thunder Rosa, man. I mean, a lot of people were like, oh, maybe it was, you know, Thunder Rosa caused it. I don't know, man. I mean, there was also a lot of rumors saying that, you know, Baker and Jamie Hayter and Rebel kind of pushed Thunder Rosa out. 
You know, there was threats being made and stuff like this. And obviously this was a while ago, but, you know, again, you can't deny what was going on, even though it was the past. Baker was a part of that situation with Thunder Rosa. And Baker was also tied to the situation with Taya Valkyrie. She might not have came out and body shamed, uh, body shamed Taya Valkyrie, but there was comments that Baker had made pertaining to Taya Valkyrie and other people. There was comments that I believe Baker made to a fan and just bashed his fan and kind of shamed this fan for no apparent reason. I think the fan made a, a decent comment. It wasn't completely bad, and Baker just went off. And, and again, nobody's being reprimanded. You know, Baker is just getting a blind eye and, and, and you know, a slap on the wrist, and then there you go. That's the stuff that needs to stop. People need to be held accountable for what they're doing. And Tony Khan, at that point, needs to be a boss. Whether you, ha you, know, you have select favorites or not, it needs to happen. And again, I'm not trying to bash AEW or Dynamite or anything else like that. There's also issues in the women's locker room in WWE as well. That's been prevalent. You know, but again, this stuff needs to be fixed. And yes, I do believe that the women's locker room deserves opportunity on TV. You need to build storylines for these women. You know, we're just now getting something for Chris Statlander. She needs to be in a predominant storyline. And I thought that was leading towards her match with Mercedes Martinez. We're going to keep building that and building that and building that matchup, leading into All In. It doesn't seem like it's really the case right now at this point. And then you also have Sheeta, who just won the title off Tony Storm, and now she's back into a tournament format to be in a tournament against Tony Storm. To be honest with you, I don't think Sheeta should have been in that tournament at all. Because she is the current women's champion. I think that's that slot that she had in this tournament should have been given to somebody else to give them an opportunity to face Sheeta at all in in this fatal four way. I don't think Sheeta should be a part of this, you know. Now credit, I don't think that match she had last night was a part of the tournament. But she doesn't need to be a part of the tournament and give other people opportunity to, to face Sheeta for the women's championship. I think that's a hundred percent what should happen. But again, it's still yet to be seen. But you know, I'm excited for All In, man. I think All In's going to be a great show. Definitely looking forward to that. It was definitely a newsworthy night last night. And again, you guys got my comments on the whole women's locker room drama and stuff like that. Again, I don't agree with a lot of it, especially the stuff that was said about Ty Valkyrie, man. I'm not a big fan of that. I just think it's completely disrespectful uh, towards anybody in that locker room, let alone Ty Valkyrie. But again, very disrespectful, and I'm not a big fan of what people were saying about Ty Valkyrie, man. It's uncalled for. Uh, but with that being said, this is my review of AEW's Dynamite. I hope you guys are out there staying safe. Be careful and remember, stay classic. Peace.